There's another song in our book that I love that has been in my mind this afternoon. Written by Harriet Buell. And the first part of the lyrics of that song are, My father is rich in houses and land. He holds the wealth of the world in his hand, of rubies and diamonds and jewels and gold. His coffers are full. He has riches untold. I am a child of the king, a child of the king with Jesus my savior. I'm a child of the king. If you understand that and if you comprehend all that that entails, then every day you live is a day of joy. Now it may not be that everything in the day is good. The Lord never promised that. But in spite of the bad things, not in the absence of bad things, but in spite of the bad things, the child of God lives with that understanding. I'm a child of the king, the one who is the supreme, the sovereign creator, the majestic king of us all, the one who is from everlasting unto everlasting, the one who is almighty and all-knowing and all-wise, The one who is constantly present. The one who is just. Who is merciful and gracious. He is love. That's my father. With that in mind, then how could I, why would I fear that moment when he judges all nations? I will stand before him like you. We all will. And he has delegated the authority to his son to execute judgment according to the words of Jesus himself in John chapter 5 verses 25 and following. He's, he is going to execute judgment and I will be judged. But I'm going to be judged by the one who who loved me enough to die for me. And the Heavenly Father, the Supreme God of Gods, and the Lord of Lords, and the Ruler of Rulers, my Father, is the one before whom you and I will stand. And He loves me so much that he gave his only begotten son to take my place. He never committed a sin, and I have. But he gave him to die as if he were the sinner, so I could be considered as one who's not the sinner. Why would I fear him? How could I fear him in that moment? Because, are you listening? 
because I say, if back then when I was still a sinner, when I was his enemy, he loved me enough to give Jesus to die for me. Now that I'm his child, how much more does he love me now? Read it with me. Turn to John, or excuse me, the, uh, the gospel written by Paul in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And I want us tonight to focus, we're just going to stay right here in the first few verses of this great chapter. And I want us to focus on verses 1 through 11. And I'm going to take a moment to read these 11 verses nonstop. And after reading all 11 of them, then we will observe some very important things about it. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulations work with patience and patience experience and experience hope and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God, by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. There's the basis of everything that I said to you prior to that reading. You look at verse 1, and you look at verse 2, and if you look at those two verses carefully and make some mental notes along the way, you see that there are no less than five wonderful things stated to us. First of all, there is a statement about divine providence. Listen to it as I emphasize it with my voice. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You and I today can enjoy forgiveness. Those of us who are Christians know our salvation is secure and it is all through Jesus Christ. And folks, let us understand and let us remember that the blessings we have and the condition that we are in spiritually tonight is because of that providence of God. And had God not done what he did for us through Jesus, there would be no hope for us. We would be helplessly and hopelessly lost. 
And had Jesus himself not been willing to come to earth and submit himself to the will of God, there would be no hope for any of us. We would be hopelessly and helplessly lost. But we have through divine providence, that is through God providing in his gospel, in his righteousness that we studied about this morning, we have these wonderful blessings in Christ. And so therefore, he says, we are justified by faith through this that God has done for us through our Lord Jesus Christ. But notice the second thing. As you start reading the verse, you see him saying, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace. So there are two blessings that he lists specifically. Two immediate blessings. There are many blessings awaiting us, of course, when we move into the spiritual and eternal realm. But right here, right now in the material and physical realm, I have two immediate blessings in Christ and through the divine providence of God, and that is I'm justified. In the Bible class hour this morning, I mentioned that word, and, and I said, you know what that word acquitted means in a court of law. That word of vindicated, somebody that has been declared not guilty. That's what justified is all about. Have I committed sins? Yes. They're in my past. But I committed them. But am I guilty of them? No. The Lord has declared not guilty. Because through my faith in Christ Jesus, by the providence of God, I can have this justification, this acquittal, and be declared by the Lord as being not guilty. And because of that, I'm at peace. With God. I may not be able to be at peace with all people. And that concerns me. And I'll tell you, I'm normal enough, take my word for it, Ray, I'm normal enough that I want you to like me. But I'll tell you this, I can live with you not liking me as long as I know my Heavenly Father approves of me. If I have His favor, I can deal with the disfavor of a fellow human being. As long as I know that any discord between me and someone else is not my doing, I can live with that. But I do not want to live a moment and be out of favor with God. I have peace with God. And out of that understanding, how sweet is the rest of the night. How sweet it is, how wonderful it is to lie down and fall asleep knowing that you're right with God. In contrast to how disturbing it is and how restless it leaves you when gnawing at your conscience is the fact that you're not at peace with God. And Paul said, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. And he says, and if you look at it carefully, that justification and that salvation is through our faith. It's mentioned twice, once in verse 1 and again in verse 2, that it is through faith, and we have access into this grace, the grace of God that saves us. And the conduit by which we access that grace is our faith. 
I would say it this way. God's grace is the channel through which He makes salvation available in Christ Jesus. My faith is the channel through which I enjoy that salvation. And that grace of God is then appropriated. It is applied to my sinful soul in Christ through the grace of God. And the access to that grace is my faith. Let me illustrate it this way. Right now, as I speak, out there in space, cyberspace we call it, millions and millions and millions of bits of information. And when we get on the internet and we type in some word or Google something, as I did earlier today, and I was, wanting, I was researching something for a paper that I'm writing, and, and so I Googled in a word and hit search, and about a thousand different sites came up. It was already there. I couldn't reach it through here, through my mind. But on the Internet... I can access those bits of information that are out there. All of that information is there, and I access it through the Internet. Now then, similarly, that's the way it is with God's grace. God's grace is already there, and it's there for everyone. His love encompasses everyone. But I access that grace through my faith comparable to the Internet. I access it through my faith in Jesus Christ, and that is what Paul is writing about here. And he said, it is in that grace that we stand, indicating a firmness, a fixed resolution, a determined person who is saying, I will not be moved. Anchored in my faith in the Lord, I will not be moved. And Paul said, and that causes me to rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And then he did something that just strikes you. He said, that's not the only thing I have joy in. I have joy in tribulations. You and I wouldn't use that word. We'd say the trials of life, the storms of life. And they all come, and we're going to talk about that in an, in, a, in an extended way tomorrow night. But life is not always good. And Paul said when those tribulations come and those trials of life come, I'm always thankful for that. And then he gave a reason for it. And look at it in verse 3. He said, we glory in tribulations knowing that tribulations work patience. Try the word perseverance there. When you're going through difficult times in life, it'll produce the ability to persevere. And patience or perseverance produces experience. Some translations say that it will give to you this character, a strength of character. And that strength of character will produce hope. He said, that's why I... I not only rejoice in my salvation in Christ, I rejoice when things are bad. When the life that I live brings trouble to me because of my faith in the Lord and my service unto God, if it brings tribulation and trials to me, I'm going to rejoice in that because of the good that can come out of it. But he's not through because he's about to explain how we can know for a fact that God loves us. Look at verse 7. Excuse me, verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, that really means when we were helpless, unable to do anything about our spiritual condition, in due time, Paul wrote about that in Galatians 4, 4, that in due time Christ came. In due time Christ died for the ungodly. 
And then he said, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Think about what that implies. I have a son and a daughter. I wouldn't, I would not hesitate to die for either one of them. I would die for them. I'd die for my wife. There are people that I love that much, and you understand that as a married man and as a father, there are people that in my life I would die for. But name some despicable person that's on death row because he was a serial killer. I'd have trouble saying I'll die for him. Let him live and let me die. But Paul said that's what God did. God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And notice how he describes us at that moment in our lives when he says much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him for if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life in my Bible I have taken a red pen and I have circled in verse 9 much more then in verse 10 I've circled much more because every time I read that I want to be reminded of the contrast that Paul is drawing. He's saying, there was a time in my life, in the life of all of us who were in sin, when I was the enemy of Christ. I was the enemy of God. I was not in favor of God, in His favor at all, because of my sins. But even when I was that enemy even when I was not in his favor, he loved me so much that he gave his only begotten son and listened to him cry from the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And as we sometimes sing, he could have called 10,000 angels. To take him down from the cross. Just like he said to Peter back in the garden when the angry mob came to arrest him. Peter drew that sword and cut off Malchus' ear. And Jesus said, put the sword up, Peter. We're not here to fight because this is a moment that must happen. This is my father's plan. And God let him be tortured. And spikes driven through his hands and his feet. And listen to him cry. Because of his love for me. I tell you tonight what I told you this morning. I don't get that. I don't understand that. Who am I? That the king would bleed and die for who am I that he would pray not my will but thine for but then the rest of that thought is if he loved me so much even when I was in my sins to die for me, now that I'm no longer in my sins and they are forgiven, they're, they're gone. They're washed away by his blood. And I'm now a child, a child of God. If he loved me that much then, 
how much more now that I'm reconciled unto him that he loves me and wants me to be saved. And when Jesus Christ comes with his mighty angels in flaming fire as the Bible depicts to take vengeance upon those that know not God and to take vengeance upon those who have obeyed not the gospel. I will not be afraid. I will rejoice. And it will not be any self-righteousness. It will not be an arrogance. At that moment, none of us, take my word for this, none of us are going to be a sin. <laughs> yeah, look at me. I deserve this. Instead, and I don't know what I would say, but I, I think if I said anything, it would have to be, thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you did for me. Because from the cross, each drop of blood that fell off of his hands and off of his feet and came streaming down his face was a sign of his love. And Paul wrote that to Jews and Gentiles that comprise the church in Rome and said he did that because you were his enemies. He did that because he loved you. Love. And we sing why did my Savior come to earth and to the humble go? And how does that chorus go? Because he loved me so. And let me remind you what this book says. This book not only says that God loved us and Jesus loved us, it also says that Jesus did what he did because he loved the Father. He loved the Father. And the Father loved him. So, I'm not worthy to even think this, but I'll just say, so can I come along beside the Apostle Paul and say, on a bad day or when life is handing me a hard time, I'm going to rejoice in that as well. Because if, if the hard times are going to draw me closer to him, then so be it. Whatever will draw me closer to God. I want that. Whatever will make me love Him more. I want that. What a great scripture this is that says... justified by faith, and he'd just written about Abraham and how Abraham was declared justified because of his faith. And then he says what, he, what was written about him 
Well, it's not just about Him, it's about us too. It's for us to understand that God has made it possible that we who were in his, his enemies can be reconciled to Him. Though you, those who disobeyed Him can be forgiven. And when that judgment day comes, the one who loved me enough to die for me, how much more will he love me now? And he's the one that will judge me. And he's the one that I'm serving now. And that's why there's reason to rejoice and to say, I'm a child of the king. Unworthy, not fit for the honor, but I sure am thankful that he did what he did. And the biblical word for it, whether from the pages of scriptures or from the pages of a hymnal, the biblical word is hallelujah. Praise be unto God for his unspeakable gift through Christ Jesus. So Christians, go home tonight with your heart full of joy. And as you close the day, thank God for the privilege, the honor of being His child and to enjoy His love and being able to access His amazing grace. Open your song books, please, to the number that Brother Ray has announced. Oftentimes, we refer to some song as a song of invitation. Sometimes we refer to it as a song of encouragement. And it's both. But let it be clearly stated and understood. The invitation's not from me. It's from him who died for you. The encouragement comes from the song. To hear that invitation from the Lord. And if you're not a Christian... You need to make the greatest decision of your life, and I want to encourage you to make it tonight. Become one. Act upon your faith in Christ. Turn away from the practice of sin. Confess your faith in Jesus, and be immersed in water in the name of Christ to have your sins forgiven. Jesus died for you. He's asking you to come and live for him. If you're a Christian who has drifted away, if you're a Christian that's not faithful to God, I remind you God still loves you. And He wants you to come back and confess your unfaithfulness with the assurance that He will forgive you. That blessing awaits you here tonight. And we sing the song to encourage you to take that action. Would you come while we stand and while we sing?